Of the many ships which carry our fighting men and materiel to every corner of the globe, some dock in fine harbors where well-established facilities make unloading fairly easy. But others must put in where there is no harbor, no dock facilities, nothing but a barren beachhead. Yet here, as nowhere else, they must load and unload quickly, for every moment the ships stand by they and their cargoes and their crews are perfect targets for bombing and strafing. That's where the ducks come in, speeding those precious cargoes ashore, not pausing at the water's edge, rolling right up to the supply dump, delivering men and supplies direct from ship to fighting front. Officially, it's the 6x6, six 2.5-ton six, amphibian truck GMC DUKW 353. Fifty of them make up an amphibian truck company which can unload two 8,000-ton cargo ships in only 72 hours. And that fast schedule must be maintained. Not only is the ship open to attack, but that schedule is part of a master strategy. Supplies must move forward on time to sustain the attack. Failure here could spell disaster on the front line, turning our invasion force back into the sea. A breakdown is serious. And it can be a serious matter for the driver, too, because he's entirely on his own. This is why preventive maintenance is so important. Every minute a driver spends working on his duck is that much extra life insurance he's giving himself. Directing this work is the company maintenance officer, responsible for keeping all vehicles in first-class operating condition. His right-hand man is the motor sergeant who supervises all maintenance operations, serves as dispatcher, and assigns mechanics to various tasks. These organization mechanics perform the second echelon services prescribed in the TM. First echelon preventive maintenance is handled by the driver and his assistant, responsible for keeping their vehicle in good condition and for promptly reporting any trouble. This first echelon maintenance may be divided into three parts. After operation, before operation, and during operation. Under combat conditions, however, crowded work schedules may require that various services be performed from time to time whenever the duck is idle. The important thing is to do every job soon enough and often enough that trouble won't have a chance to develop. Let's begin with after operation. As soon as the wheels can carry the vehicle forward, disengage the water propeller. This is to avoid burning the outboard bearing, which is not cooled by water on land. Before proceeding inland, the driver and his assistant first remove their life jackets. They then proceed to open the hull drain valves. One of these is located behind the driver's seat. The stencil indicates the open position. The second valve is in the driver's compartment. Two others will be found at the rear corners of the cargo compartment. All four must be open to drain all compartments of the hull. In front of the driver's seat are the bilge pump controls. All these levers are set in the open position. With the valves open, the vehicle is driven to the pool or parking area where the rest of the maintenance services are performed. The valves are open so the hull will be well drained by the time the vehicle reaches the bivouac area. Much of the job is the same as on a standard two and a half ton six by six truck since that's the chassis on which the duck is built. Because of this, we'll omit services common to both and concentrate on those peculiar to the duck when it's working in water. As in all preventive maintenance work, the men follow War Department Form Number 48, covering all items which apply, plus a number of others detailed in TM 9-802 under Preventive Maintenance Services. Using the special tool provided, the driver first removes the three drive shaft housing drain plugs. There is one on each drive shaft near the axle, two here at the rear, the third up front. 
They must be removed for that lubrication job that's coming later. Removing them will also help when you're flushing and draining the vehicle. If the plugs are not replaced immediately, tie them to the steering wheel as a reminder to you to put them in before entering the water. At the same time, inspect the six shaft housing seals, looking for any sign of damage or deterioration which might cause a leak. When these operations are completed, they prepare the duct for a thorough check. First, the tarpaulin comes off. Then the crossbows. Finally, all floorboards and air intake grills. The three hatches are opened to vent the entire vehicle and facilitate cleaning. Cleanliness is all important in the duct. There's no brass to polish, but usually there's trash which must be removed so it won't clog the bilge pump strainers or interfere with air circulation through the radiator. And there's a wash job both inside and outside. Use plenty of fresh water to remove every trace of salt, which hastens corrosion, and gasoline or oil, which might be a fire hazard. It's easier with a hose and fresh water under pressure, but either way, the job must be thorough. Whenever possible, the drive shaft housings are flushed with a hose. That's one of the reasons why those drain plugs were removed before. Inspect the strainers on the two bilge pumps and the hull compartment strainers in each rear corner of the cargo compartment. If necessary, remove and clean them with fresh water to remove sand and sediment. Grease or oil can be removed with dry cleaning solvent. The primer strainer on the left side of the hull by the driver's seat is serviced from outside of the vehicle. When all strainers have been cleaned and replaced, the men carefully inspect the hull. Scrapes and scratches are covered with OD paint. If rust is found, it should be removed and the spot should then be repainted as outlined in TM 9-802. Any holes or weak points should be reported to higher echelon for repair. Next item on the docket is lubrication. But a smart driver will always stop long enough to police up and keep his duct clean. Three of the universal joints are reached through the drain plug holes in the rear drive shaft housing. If necessary, the duct is moved slightly to align the grease fittings over the holes. This can be done by engaging the hand cranking ratchet on the propeller shaft. After each universal joint has been lubricated, the drain plug gets a thin film of grease. This will make it easier for you to remove the plugs on the next lubrication job. Now follows the complete tour in accordance with the official lubrication guide, number 505. We won't take time to go through it, but bear in mind that many points which are lubricated rather infrequently on an ordinary truck must be serviced daily when the duck operates in water. When he's finished with the grease gun, he makes another trip with an oil can. Some of the oil can points are indicated on the lubrication guide, and a complete list is given in TM 9-802. Oil is your best friend in fighting corrosion. In addition to all controls and linkages, be sure to oil towing shackles, hinges, wing nuts, and every other spot where there is motion between two parts. Get them all. A strictly nautical job is checking condition and alignment of the rudder. When the two guide pins on the steering wheel are exactly in up-center position, the rudder should point straight back. Before venturing up into the tunnel, the driver plays smart. That's right. Get away from those controls and see that nobody starts the engine. He's taking no chance of getting a haircut from that prop. 
After making sure the propeller retaining nut and lock nut are secure, he tests for excess play in the water propeller shaft strut bearing. Then rotating the propeller by hand, he lubricates the water propeller shaft strut bearing. A number of other points must be serviced in the same way. They are all clearly indicated on the lubrication guide. Meanwhile, inside the stern hatch, the assistant driver, in addition to greasing and oiling, checks the rudder controls, cables, and pulleys to see that they're in good operating condition. Then there's the winch shear pin. In order to check it, remove the cotter pin and turn the winch drive shaft. Then pull it out and inspect for signs of corrosion or shearing. If it's damaged, put in a new one. But first, examine the universal coupling to see that the shear pin hole isn't elongated and make certain that the universal is not frozen on the shaft. Then the pin can go back in place. Don't overlook that cotter pin. Be sure to replace it in the shear pin after you've made your inspection. Another phase of the lubrication job worth special mention is daily inspection of all gear cases. Here, the driver is checking the gear oil level in the main transfer case. He's also on the lookout for any sign of water contamination. If he found it, he'd inspect the case and vent tube for breaks or leaks, then drain and refill the case. Finally, he checks the vent. This same procedure is followed on the water propeller transfer case, transmission, pillow block, and differentials. The assistant's making sure the spare tire is properly inflated in good condition. He also checks to make sure the tire is securely fastened down to the deck. He sees that the anchor is in place and lashed down securely. Now for a thorough inspection of the winch. After making sure the mounting bolts are secure, he sees that the cable is properly wound, clean, and coated with engine oil. The brake and clutch must both be in perfect operating condition. The clutching rope also must pass inspection. Remember that here again there's a lubrication job directed by the lubrication guide. Inside the hull, too, are many points to be serviced with grease gun and oil can, and a number of other inspections to be made. Examine the rubber hose where the propeller shaft goes through the hull. Also the clamps. Check all drive shafts for alignment of bearings and tightness of supports. Inspect air, gas, and hydraulic brake lines for leaks, kinks, or other defects. Examine the Higgins centrifugal bilge pump and drive chain for general condition and alignment. See that the chain has the proper tension. The felt pad under the pump also rates an inspection. Under the driver's seat is the Gould centrifugal bilge pump. This is inspected in the same way as the Higgins bilge pump. And the tension of the drive chain is checked. Examine the pump hoses and clamps. Make sure there is no leakage. Since the dock cannot easily be abandoned at sea, the fire extinguishers must be on the job. Take them down and make sure they're full. Check for corrosion around the tip and operating handle. But don't pump it till you mean business. In this passageway is the air tank of the tire inflation system. The pet cock in the bottom of the tank is open to drain off condensation. Springs and suspensions are inspected and lubricated as on any vehicle, but salt water operations make it necessary to service them more often. This applies also to checking the wheels. 
First, however, the tire inflation device must come off. With the line valve shut off, loosen the lock nuts on the three hub device lock bolts. Then back off these lock bolts enough to free them from the hub locking bolts. Pull the unit away from the hub and proceed in the usual way to test security of all flange nuts and cap screws. After replacing the inflation device, make sure it's locked on the hub and tighten the lock nuts firmly. Then give it a general inspection. Repeat the operation on all wheels. Up on the forward deck, the driver is inspecting the auxiliary hand bilge pump which must be ready to meet an emergency. The foot valve, in particular, must be undamaged. And the suction valve leather is flexible. The pump must be fastened down securely. Check over the surfboard and its props to see that all parts are present and undamaged. Examine all hatch covers and seals for condition and alignment. Now down the hatch to the air compressor. All connections must be tight. Hoses and lines must be free from leaks and kinks. This plug is removed to check the oil level in the crankcase. Oil is added if needed. After checking all the wheels and with all tire line valves open, the assistant driver is ready to test the tire inflation system. Moving the control lever to inflate position, he sees that the pressure gauge registers an increase. With the lever set for deflate, the pressure should drop. Tires should be left at the correct pressure for the terrain over which the duct will next travel. Remember, be sure to close the tire line valves after the tires have been inflated to the proper pressure. Caution and instruction plates must be legible. Wiping them off with an oily rag helps prevent deterioration. A final group of inspections down in the engine hatch compartment. Check the battery in the usual way. The hold down clamps must be secure. Terminals must be tight and free from corrosion. Clean them often. A little grease on the terminals will help you fight corrosion. Check the radiator too, and in cold climates, test the antifreeze. Be sure to replace the radiator and overflow caps tightly. The fan belt must be in good condition with the proper deflection. Wiping the blades with an oily rag helps fight off corrosion. Check the crankcase oil level as usual with the dipstick. Add oil if needed. The ignition system is shielded to keep out water. See that the cover is in good condition and tightly sealed. Keep checking for leaks or damage to any of the gas, oil, water, or air lines. Another place to inspect is the rudder cable system. Nearby are the tire inflation control valves. These must be secure and in good condition, which means, of course, no leaks. All electric terminals must be tight and clean. Don't give corrosion a chance to cut through. Finally, make sure that all spare equipment is present here and on every part of the vehicle. Every item must be on board. When the duck's at sea, you can't run to the depot for that missing part.
The checklist will be found in TM 9-802. Refueling is important to all vehicles, but especially to the duck. So the main tank and spare container must be kept full. After filling the tank, be sure that the vent in the gas tank cap is open. Final job is to replace grills, floorboards, crossbows, and the tarpaulin, inspecting this for rips or tears. The men who do a thorough job of their after operation maintenance can lay off knowing that their duck is ready for action the instant it's called. No operations are scheduled tonight, so the duck remains just as the men left it. At least that's what they hope the following morning. But they take no chances. They'll make sure their duck hasn't been tampered with or sabotaged or used by someone else. In addition, they'll perform all the services prescribed on War Department Form Number 48 for before operation. The main idea is to make certain the duck's fully ready for water operation. Once at sea, it's too late to make repairs. Underneath, look for leaks. And see that the hull is not damaged and that all drive shaft housing plugs and hull drain plugs are securely in place. Once again, the oil level and the water levels should be checked just to make doubly sure. The water propeller shaft strut bearing of the propeller takes a real beating in salt water. So lubricate the bearing now and again after every water run. See that all tools and spare parts are present. You never know. Some Joe may have borrowed something when you weren't around. Make a last minute check of the fuel supply, both main tank and five gallon fuel and water containers. Before hitting the water, make sure all four hull drain valves are closed. Don't assume they are just because you closed them the night before. Since the Gould bilge pump handles only one compartment at a time, only one valve should be open, but one must be open. This is to relieve strain on the pump. As you start her up, listen closely for unusual noises. If anything sounds queer, investigate. Before you start rolling, make sure your tires are inflated to the correct pressure. 40 pounds is okay for that road ahead. As you roll along, continue to keep your ears alert for sounds of trouble. Keep your eyes alert, too. Watch the instruments to see that they're functioning properly. Remember, any adjustment or repair is possible while you're still on dry land. In the water, continually check operation of your bilge pumps and watch the various compartments to see that you're not shipping more water than is normal. Because the bilge pumps operate whenever the water propeller is engaged, lubricate them regularly as directed in TM 9-802. In addition to the pointers given here, use your own good common sense and stay on the ball. Remember, we've covered only those extra first echelon services made necessary by saltwater operation. The duck also demands all the attentions given any other truck. Above all, make the job complete, thorough, all-inclusive, because carelessness may leave you stranded on the high sea. Carelessness may put your duck out of service. And what does that mean? Well, what's under the tarp? That's where you'll find the answer. Shells. Shells that didn't get ashore. Shells that didn't get to the front. A gun that fell silent. 
And this, the price paid for a driver's carelessness. Is it really so much trouble to keep those ducks in shape? Think it over. at home either on water or land, and designed to move men and equipment to combat areas. Ducks, D-U-K-W-S. In describing a duck, you wouldn't say it was a boat or a truck, but a combination of both. If you had X-ray eyes and could look through the side of its hull, here's what you'd see. Notice the large cargo space almost 200 cubic feet, able to carry upward to 9,000 pounds. On the top of the duck is the A-frame, capable of lifting 4,000 pounds. The winch, which raises it mechanically, is controlled from the driver's compartment. Operating the A-frame to load and unload cargo is an important phase in a man's training on the duck. Among the other things a man must know about his duck, he must know why and how the tire pressure is adjusted to fit various roads and ground conditions. This is done according to printed instructions on the dashboard. Moving this control lever does the trick. It either inflates or deflates the tires as desired. Under certain conditions, such as when going through deep sand, the tire pressure requirement is much less than at other times so the tires are kept comparatively soft. However, when driving on a hard, flat surface, the situation is reversed and the tire pressure is kept high. But it's not as simple as all that. The duck driver must also learn to operate his vehicle not only individually, but in groups and under varying conditions, such as he might meet when operating in heavy surf in soft, sandy areas, and in river crossings. After this phase of the training, the driver receives his permit to operate all types of amphibian trucks. Now let's see how the individual driver fits into a company about to enter a simulated combat operation. First of all, he stencils his name on the duck which has been assigned to him. Then he's ready for the pre-operation maintenance check, in which he systematically inspects and tests the equipment to see that it's all in good working order. He begins the check in the bow compartment. Next in line is the engine compartment. The radiator and surge tank are checked to make sure they have the proper water level. Gasoline and oil lines for possible leaks, wear or damage. And the bilge for excess water are other items on the checklist, as is the crankcase in which the proper oil level must be maintained. All working parts in this compartment must be very closely examined so that engine failure will not impair the maximum operating efficiency of the duct. Working toward the stern, the driver's compartment is the next stop. The engine is started and all instruments are checked, including oil and gas gauges and so forth. Before leaving the seat, the driver opens the valves on the tire inflation system. While the engine is warming up, he goes to the cargo compartment to inspect two important marine features of the duct. First, the bilge pump mechanism. This must be in perfect working order to discharge excess water that may enter the hull. Next, the propeller drive shaft, which is under the stern floorboard. The driver sees that the shaft is properly lubricated and in good operating condition.
Then at the stern hatch, he makes sure that he has his full complement of supplies. Life jackets, snatch blocks, line, and other items. Having completed the inspection inside the duck, the driver is ready to examine the outside hull for possible leaks. Then he inspects the propeller and the rudder to complete the pre-operation maintenance check. Now for the big show as a full-fledged simulated beach assault gets underway. Ducks loaded with artillery and other equipment to be used in the beachhead assault roll up into an LST. Nearby, another group of combat-loaded ducks are hoisted aboard AKAs for the same assault. While proceeding to the assault point, the drivers make the final maintenance checks and necessary adjustments on their ducks. The job of the ducks in a landing of this sort is to bring in the vital supplies of the various services, artillery, ammunition, signal communication equipment, and others, and to do it without the loss of equipment or time. For bringing in artillery, two ducks work as a team. While advancing toward the beach, the trails of the gun are spread to enable firing it from the duck if necessary. One duck carries the gun and half the gun crew, plus emergency ammunition. While the other duck with the A-frame and razor carries the rest of the gun crew and the bulk of the ammunition. The approved combat load on each duck is about 7,500 pounds. As the two ducks arrive on the beach, they get set for the removal of the gun. While the duck with the A-frame moves a short distance away, the artillery crew prepares the gun for unloading. Meanwhile, the A-frame is raised into a lifting position by engaging the winch control lever in the driver's compartment. By this time, the crew on the gun duck has fastened ropes to the muzzle and the trails of the piece to steady it when it will be lifted out. Now the other duck is backed against the side of the gun duck with the A-frame in position to lift the gun. A jack is placed beneath the stern of the A-frame duck to keep it from tipping under the weight of the load. A hook is inserted in the cables around the gun, and the A-frame cable is winched up with the crew steadying the gun by means of the guidelines. Immediately after the gun is lifted clear, the driver and his assistant move the gun duck forward in order that the gun can be lowered to the ground. The crew immediately disengages the guidelines and the cable hook from the gun. They couple the gun with lunette down to the same duck that brought it ashore. Once this is done, the crew climbs aboard the duck and the gun is moved to its initial firing position on shore. The A-frame duck may either follow the gun duck or may move to an ammunition dump to unload. After the gun has been placed in position and the ammunition unloaded, the ducks are released. Not only because they are crucially needed to bring in additional supplies, but also because their size and huge silhouette make them an easy target for enemy fire. The driver of the gun duck has received a map marked with the location where the gun was set up. He gives this map to the designated control point so that the prime mover of the gun will be able to locate it. The duck is then directed to the duck park for further assignments. Meanwhile, the other ducks have been at work bringing in engineers' beach matting, reconnaissance vehicles, and other vital equipment needed immediately for the assault phase. In addition to the A-frame ducks, cranes and derricks are used to expedite unloading of this material. If there is a wait at this point of the operation, all idle ducks are dispersed and camouflaged as the duck company sets up in a protected area. During this period, the duck crews undertake whatever maintenance and minor repairs the vehicles might need. 
One of the ducks, set apart as a duck control center, or DCC, has come ashore as soon as it was safe. At a location some distance from where landing boats will beach, the DCC coordinates the duck units for the job ahead, that of hauling in supplies from the cargo ships. As soon as the first of the cargo ships comes in, the naval commander or attack force sends a message to the shore party commander, informing him what ships are ready for unloading at specified times. This is immediately relayed to the duck control center. Once the DCC has this information, he can start his duck units moving. He sends orders by radio, runner, or other means to withdraw the necessary ducks from the various companies. The specified ducks report to the duck park, ready to embark for the cargo ships when needed. The first duck dispatched by the DCC to a cargo ship is called a mooring line duck, or molly. Its purpose is to set up mooring lines which the cargo carrying ducks can hook into at the proper position for loading. The molly carries a rigging unit, mooring and light lines, and an extra portable radio set. Besides its regular crew, which includes two men adept at rigging, the molly carries a duck officer and a radio operator who will stay aboard the cargo ship to be unloaded. The driver of Molly and one of the riggers remain below while the others go aboard the cargo ship. The duck officer consults with the ship transportation officer to find out what hold and what side the ducks will work first. This information is relayed by the NCO from the deck by means of hand signals. Molly comes up to about 70 feet downwind of where a mooring line will be rigged. A light line is dropped over the side to tie into the end of the heavy mooring line. The mooring line is pulled up on deck and secured. Then the light line is detached with the NCO supervising and helping in the operation. Now the light line is dropped again, further forward where Molly has moved into position. After the other end of the mooring line is attached to the light line, it is pulled up and secured. Molly then makes a final check of the mooring line to make sure that the cargo ducks can hook onto it at the right position for receiving loads. As soon as the line is rigged, Molly picks up her NCO and the other rigger and stands by for further instructions from the DCC. Meanwhile, the duck officer is advised by the ship's transportation officer of the type of cargo and the time of unloading. All that information is radioed to the DCC. Upon receipt of this message, the DCC officer will be able to figure which ducks under his control are available. Then preparations are made to dispatch the necessary ducks from the duck park to ship side at the intervals stated by the duck officer. Now Navy communicates with the shore party commander concerning other cargo ships to be unloaded. Then the message is relayed to the DCC. The DCC in turn sends Molly to these ships. A duck officer and radio operator are also sent to each ship designated by Navy to be unloaded. The appointed time has arrived for the unloading of the first ship. A cargo duck draws up and hooks onto the mooring line. During loading, the engine is kept going to hold the mooring line taut. This keeps the duck in the right position for receiving its load of cargo. The duck crew stands in the stern to receive the first loaded net. As it comes down, they push it against the forward cargo compartment bulkhead.
Then they unhook the loaded net. Replacement nets are attached to the hook and hauled aboard the cargo ship. The crew moves to the bow of the duck to stand clear of the next load. They move back for this load as it descends. It is pushed sternward, and if there's a third and final load, it is lowered directly into the center of the cargo compartment. This procedure is followed for loading from all hatches except those at the stern and the bow of the ship, where, because of the concave hull, two ducks are lashed together, the outer one receiving the load. They are kept running under twin motor power and unlashed when clear of the ship. On reaching shore, the ducks check in at the DCC with their loads. They are directed to the dump set aside for their particular supplies. Road signs posted along the way direct the drivers to the supply dumps. In the dump, an A-frame is sometimes used for unloading, but only if no crane is available. The original nets, slings, and pallets used to unload from ship to duck are used throughout to eliminate manhandling. These are returned by other ducks to the ship at a later time. The duck officer stationed at each dump directs the unloading and prevents any jamming of vehicles. He uses any possible expedient to speed up unloading, such as these slanting hog troughs. If the supply dumps are four miles or more inland, the driver takes his load to a transfer point. From there, trucks take over the cargo for the rest of the trip. After unloading, the ducks return to the duck park, either to be redispatched by the DCC or to be returned to their companies. While waiting, the drivers check and service their vehicles, and if necessary, make minor repairs. Serious malfunctions in a duck must be referred to maintenance. During their stay at the duck park, the drivers also get a chance to indulge in a little personal refueling. But ducks are versatile vehicles, and it isn't long until there's a new assignment for the duck driver. Perhaps it will be a river crossing. In strong currents, range markers are set up on the opposite bank to guide the ducks across. At night, in fog or in a smoke screen, a cable run diagonally across stream helps to utilize the current in crossing. The duck is attached to the cable by a snatch block. Returning casualties to shipboard is another important job allotted to the duck. When these casualties are to go aboard an LST, the duck drives right up the ramp into the hold of the ship. For other ships, the ambulance duck may be lifted up bodily to the deck, or the casualties may be taken through the lower port. Yes, the duck is mighty handy. It can push landing craft around so that they can retract from shore. It can pull motor vehicles ashore that have bogged down or drowned out. Used rightly with cargo ships as close to shore as possible, with supply dumps close to the beach to reduce wear and tear on the vehicles, ocean going, or land-loving, ducks are marvels of efficiency.